2,000 meals. The most important activity is ranges, salad counters in the kitchen, nor on the telephone on which delivery orders are received, nor is the key element the front door through which the customers come and go in a constant stream. The most important activity is at the cash register, whose audit strip is the history of the day's operations. The record of cash received, credit extended, refunds made, invoices paid, discounts taken, taxes withheld, and ultimately profits or losses incurred. Without successful performance here, all the other activity in this establishment would soon stop. But the cash register, after all, is just a machine. And far more important to the profit and loss picture is the man who stands behind it. Not the cashier, but the person in the company who takes facts like those recorded on the cash register audit strip and manages them with intelligence and skill. There are, among business managers, those in charge of producing what the company sells and those in charge of selling what's produced. But there's also a third management function, as important in many ways as the first two, and that is the management of the company's finances. National Educational Television presents a series of programs analyzing the basic nature and operation of the American business system, with particular emphasis here on financial management. This series is made possible by an educational grant from the National Association of Manufacturers and is produced under the editorial control of a committee of economic educators. Hello, I'm Jack Gwynn. Compared with large companies having many hundreds of employees, huge investments in plant and facilities, and dozens of products or services for sale, a restaurant is a fairly uncomplicated business. For that reason, because it is relatively simple in its operation, we've started here in our effort to find out what the financial manager does, what his function is in the modern business firm. In observing the responsibilities of this executive, it's probably best to look first at what he's most deeply concerned with. Money. Cash. This is the stuff that flows through his hands, moving in and out constantly. Not as it does in any ordinary household, but in much larger volume. For Bill Wilson, the man in charge of the finances of Sutmiller's restaurant, Supervising the flow of money is his biggest responsibility. The first funds ever to flow through Bill Wilson's hands into the cash reservoir of this firm consisted of the savings of the investors, who decided this was a likely way to increase their money. But the investors' funds were not sufficient to get the business started. So, in addition, arrangements were made for a loan from a bank, backed up with a mortgage on the building. This was a long-term loan, which means that it could be paid back over a period of many years. From time to time, as major improvements have had to be made, Wilson has supplemented the first long-term bank loan with further short-term borrowings, which must be repaid within a matter of months. The first money to flow out of the company went for the building, all the kitchen and dining room equipment that had to be put into it. These are the fixed assets, as they're called, assets that remain in use indefinitely. The next major outflow of cash went and continues to go for the firm's inventory, the stock of foods, beverages, and other materials needed to create what the company offers for sale, in this case, meals. Some of the inventory will also consist of goods in the process of being produced and of finished goods waiting to be sold. As long as the firm remains in business, it can expect a fairly steady outflow of funds for both fixed assets and inventory. But the company will always have to replace equipment and it'll always need supplies. To put these cash flows in visual form, 
Let's think of the restaurant's cash register as a pool of money and regard the money put into or taken out of it as streams leading into or out of the pool. First came the owner's personal investment. Then in came the money that was borrowed. Money flowed out for the building, equipment, and other fixed assets. And for the supplies and labor needed to create an inventory of the things the company offers for sale. Intermittently, there are also outflows as the company meets interest charges on its loans, pays its taxes, returns dividends to the owners for the use of their money, and pays off its debts. The biggest and steadiest inflow will come as a result of the sale of the company's inventory of products. In the case of a restaurant, most sales will be for cash, which brings an immediate inflow into the pool. But there are also sales on credit, in which the inflow takes place only when bills owed by customers are actually paid. So this is how cash flows through a business. And the balancing of that cash flow is a major responsibility of financial manager Bill Wilson. He must see to it that the two flows, in and out, do more than just balance at the end of the month. For if, at any time, the cash outflow is much greater than the inflow, the reservoir may fall to such a level that the financial manager cannot meet the company's obligations when they come due. At this point, the firm becomes what's known as technically insolvent. It's not bankrupt, but neither is it paying its bills. And though the company may not actually have to close its doors, there is a considerable embarrassment in being forced to ask for extensions of time either from suppliers or from the banks from which it borrows. One of the major responsibilities of management is to see to it that this situation does not occur. For it brings more than personal embarrassment. It seriously affects a firm's ability to obtain the outside financing almost every company must have from time to time. In small firms, like this one, the financial manager often has extra duties in addition to handling the company's finances. For this reason, Bill Wilson does not really illustrate all the functions a financial manager can and, and often does perform, especially in larger companies where there is greater division of responsibility at all levels, including the managerial level. Such a firm is the one that manufactured the cash register, National Cash Register Company of Dayton, Ohio, NCR it's frequently called. In addition to cash registers, NCR manufactures electronic computers and bookkeeping and adding machines for use in retail stores, banks and offices. Much of this equipment is far more complex and more costly than even the most sophisticated cash register. Dollar flow through this company each year is measured not in the hundreds of thousands as with Sutmiller's restaurant, but in the hundreds of millions. An indication of the importance of the financial manager in a company of this size is the fact that NCR's top finance officer, Stanley Lang, carries the title executive vice president. If Mr. Lang's job involved only the supervision of the flow of cash into and out of the company treasury, even a cash flow in the hundreds of millions, it's not likely that he'd rank so high in the executive echelon. But his duties are, in fact, much broader than that, as we can see by his experiences of recent years. To set the scene for the events in which Mr. Lang became involved, it's necessary to go back a little into NCR's history. For many years, the firm has been a major supplier of equipment used by banks, department stores, insurance companies and the like in processing checks, and charge accounts, and uh, hundreds of other types of financial transactions that businesses must carry out quickly, accurately, and in tremendous volume each day. The machines the company developed are downright fantastic. Among other things, they can actually read letters and numbers printed in magnetic ink, and then go on to process the information contained in those characters. Then, in the 1950s, there was a new development, the speeding up of data processing even further 
through the use of electronics. Computers were tied in with various accounting machines, memorizing all sorts of facts about customer transactions, bringing those facts instantly up to date, speeding information to branch offices and performing other remarkable new services. The increase in volume, speed, and efficiency was revolutionary. As a firm that had long been a leader in the business machine field, Mr. Lang's company saw in this development a new opportunity to broaden the range of its products and services. This meant the construction of new facilities for additional research in a highly demanding field. It meant the addition to the company's staff of experts in several new lines of work. It meant changes in manufacturing methods and sales. And above all, as far as Stanley Lang's job was concerned, it meant the investment of many millions of dollars to pay for all these new facilities and personnel. It's customary for companies to set aside depreciation reserves on current property for ultimate reinvestment in new or replacement property. In addition, earnings of pension plans are also available. In this case, however, the capital needs of the company exceeded the funds available from these sources. As financial manager, one of Lang's main jobs is to help make financial plans for the future. And that includes plans for the replacement of plants, machinery, and equipment as they wear out and become obsolete, or as the company grows. The move into electronic data processing had made it necessary to obtain $80 million worth in one swoop. This is not to say that the need for such a sum came as a sudden surprise. In preparing his plans, the financial manager must work very closely with the company's other managers. Independent planning on his part would be meaningless. It has to take into account future decisions or actions by the people in charge of production and marketing. Consequently, planning, financial and otherwise, is a team effort to which the financial manager contributes his own specialized knowledge and experience. And from their knowledge and experience, Stanley Lang and other company officers were familiar with the dilemma of a very successful expanding company requiring additional cash. This is quite a common occurrence. In many cases, successful companies find themselves short of cash because a large part of their increasing production is sold on credit and the goods sold will not be paid for immediately. For a while, the more they sell, the more their supply of money on hand diminishes. In NCR's case, though, it was the big jump into a new field, the big expansion that created the need for funds. And the problem was further complicated by the fact that electronic data processing systems are not usually purchased by those who use them. The larger systems cost from $200,000 upward, and few outside the U.S. government are prepared to make that kind of outlay. So manufacturers rent rather than sell the machines to their customers. And that means the manufacturers must meet the costs of building and installing the machines without recovering those costs for some time. We said that company planning is, and must be, a team effort. But when it came to the question of how to raise the $80 million, Lang and his financial colleagues could expect little help from their associates in the production, marketing, or other departments. This was pretty much the exclusive problem of the finance experts. Now, the thought of trying to raise $80 million may seem staggering, as indeed it is. Who would possibly entrust a sum like that to a company planning to bring out a new line of products in a field already very competitive? Well, surprisingly enough, there are vast sums of cash available to a thriving firm like NCR. The financial market puts funds at the disposal of such companies in just about any quantity imaginable, as long as it regards the venture as likely to result in profits. The money is available from a variety of sources, with all sorts of possible arrangements for repayment. And the challenging task of the finance manager is to recommend the combination of these money-raising methods that'll be best for his company. This means the company must attempt to foresee changes in interest rates, particularly in the rates charged on long-term borrowings. 
if changes are anticipated in such interest rates, a firm can save a great deal of money. If rates are on their way down, it postpones long-term commitments. But if it feels that rates are about to rise, it seeks to obtain long-term needs quickly before rates do go any higher. If the business happens to be one involving a high degree of risk, however, it may not be possible for a company to borrow funds. It might be necessary to sell part of the ownership of the company in order to raise the needed cash. An example of this would be a new firm preparing, let's say, to go into a long-shot gold mining venture. Such a company could hardly expect to obtain a loan from a bank. However, it might very possibly be able to raise cash by selling stock in the company to investors willing to share the high risks involved in the hope of making a commensurately large profit. This selling of ownership, or part of ownership, of a firm is called equity financing. And it's by no means engaged in only by highly speculative business firms. Virtually all the so-called blue chip companies in American industry, including NCR, have sold shares of stock to obtain the money needed to carry on their operations. In fact, it's the shares of those companies' stocks that are referred to when people talk of the blue chips. All right then, Lang might raise the money by selling additional shares of stock. One big advantage of doing it that way will be that the stock will bring no periodic claims for interest due on the money obtained. If there are profits, purchasers of the stock share in them. Otherwise, they're paid nothing. The big disadvantage is that every share of additional stock sold dilutes the ownership of the present stockholders. But of course, if the money raised by selling additional shares increases the company's earning capacity, the value of each share is not diluted after all. It's as though I owned a four-family apartment house and wanted to make some major renovations. I could do this by selling a quarter of the ownership in the building to another person and using the money to pay for the improvements. I don't even have to worry about the principal. However, my ownership is diluted by one quarter. I now own only three-fourths, not the entire house. But with the improvements that have been made, my house, or rather our house, is now worth more. It'll bring higher rentals. And if the rental income is more than one-fourth greater than it used to be, what does it matter if I own only three-fourths of the building? My equity is worth more than it was before. So with the stockholders of NCR. How else could the money needed be raised? The only alternative to equity financing is credit financing. That is, borrowing. Could the company go to a bank, as Bill Wilson did, and obtain a loan? It certainly could, but not for an amount even approaching $80 million. Few banks, not even the largest, are willing to risk that kind of money in a single loan, especially a loan that cannot be readily transferred. However, there is a way for an established organization to borrow very large sums of money, and that's by issuing bonds. A bond is much like a note that one signs when borrowing money at a bank, but with a big difference. Like a note, it's a promise to repay a specified sum of borrowed money within a specified period of time and at a specified rate of interest. The difference is that unlike the note, the bond is transferable. If the bondholder becomes pressed and needs his money, he can sell the bond on the open market at the going rate. Also, bonds can be issued in any denomination desired so that a great many people can buy them. They can be offered to the public at large, thus giving the borrower an opportunity to obtain much greater funds than he might be able to obtain from just a few sources. So, the choices open to NCR lay between selling stocks or bonds. The company decided to sell both stocks and bonds. How does a company go about selling either? Let's take a look. Let's take the bonds first. It's possible for a firm to sell its bonds privately, dealing directly with the buyer, who might be either an individual or a trust fund or other institution. But if the amount of money to be raised is large, 
The bonds are usually sold to investment bankers who then sell them to the public at a slightly higher price than they themselves paid. New issues of stock are marketed in much the same way, except that private sales of stock are less common than are the private sales of bonds. In both cases, the initial source of much of the capital that's put to work by industry is the savings of private citizens. Savings that originally were put into bank accounts, insurance policies, savings and loan association memberships, or contributions to retirement and pension funds and the like. The task of assembling these funds and making them available for productive purposes, converting them into capital, is accomplished by institutions known as financial intermediaries. They include, first of all, the commercial banks, and also the mutual savings banks, insurance companies, pension and retirement trusts, credit unions, finance companies, and others. These intermediaries, using the cash that's been entrusted to them by individual savers, in turn entrust the money to men like Lang. After taking every possible precaution to make sure that he and his colleagues have good prospects of putting the funds to effective use. That the funds will be put to effective use is of equal or even greater concern to financial manager Lang. In fact, another of his major responsibilities is checking on the success of the company's financial planning, measuring actual performance against the performance that had been predicted and expected. Now that the company's new electronic data processing equipment is in full production, and MCR finds itself locked in a competitive battle with other firms in the field, Lang keeps a constant watch over costs and sales to see how they compare with the predictions. If either costs or sales should stray in the wrong direction from the line that's been forecast for them, he and other members of the management team must plan corrective action. In the meantime, there's still other duties that occupy the attention of the financial manager. From time to time in the past, Lang has had to contend with an excess of money on hand. Such temporarily idle funds cannot be allowed to remain idle. They must be converted into some kind of income earning assets. But more often, greater returns can be realized on such funds by putting them into additional inventory or new plant or equipment. In other words, a company organized to manufacture data processing, accounting, and bookkeeping equipment can be expected to do better by investing in that field than by investing elsewhere. So we see that controlling a company's cash is not a simple or automatic process. A finance manager cannot merely follow some established rule of thumb. He's in a perpetual dilemma. The more cash he keeps on hand, the easier it'll be for him to handle the firm's obligations as they come due. But the more of the firm's assets that he keeps in cash, the less will he be able to devote to earning a return. Putting it another way, the more he piles up cash to protect the company against the risk of insolvency, the more he loses the opportunity to make a profit by investing that money outside. But by the same token, if he risks the credit reputation of the firm by not meeting debts on time because cash is tied up in investments, then he's likely to reduce the company's chances for making profits in the long run. No, controlling cash is not at all easy or automatic. Take the matter of accounts receivable, money owed to a company by its customers. The finance manager must supervise such accounts to make sure funds are not tied up in unduly slow accounts. But how slow is unduly slow? When do you press the slow accounts, even at the risk of losing their trade? There's a similar double-barreled question when it comes to inventory. How big an inventory is too big? And how small is too small? If costs are about to go up, the biggest inventory may be too small, and vice versa. Then, too, there are many circumstances in which the financial manager has no immediate control over the forces affecting his company's cash position, its supply of money on hand. 
Such forces frequently come from outside. For example, there's the general business situation which no company can do much about. How do you head off a sudden unexpected downturn in economic activity? A financial manager can only hope that his firm's affairs will be in the best condition to weather such a downturn when it comes. Does this mean the financial manager can blame fate for his company's failure to make profits? Is he less concerned than the production and marketing managers with the need to avoid losses? Quite the contrary. To function effectively, he must not only be sure that his own actions bring the maximum advantage to the firm, but must also help judge the potential profitability of actions suggested by other company officers. The finance officer of a firm that does business with NCR offers an example of this multiple responsibility. This is George Burke of the Burke Fuel and Heating Company of Hawthorne, New York. One of the services his company provides its customers is keeping track of the fuel oil in their tanks and refilling the tanks before the supply gets too low. This is done through complex computations based on the capacity of the customer's tank, the amount of oil the customer uses under varying weather conditions, date of the last delivery, and the kind of weather that Hawthorne has had hour by hour in the interim. It's been suggested that the company purchase a data processing machine to handle this chore a machine that also would be available to speed up and simplify such operations as inventory control, payroll, billing, and so on. George Burke is all in favor of having such equipment, but as financial manager, he must answer questions that do not necessarily come up in the production and marketing departments. Could the money the machine will cost be used more profitably elsewhere? Will the expenditure strain the company's cash position Will the machine's cost be offset by economies it'll bring or by the profits of expanded capacity it'll make possible? These are some of the decisions the finance manager must sweat out more or less alone. But when the decision is made to buy or not to buy the equipment, such financial considerations will have at least equal weight with those of the production and marketing people. And that's how it is with most of the major decisions of industry. With the financial manager sharing, if not equal billing, at least equal responsibility when the chips are down. As we've looked at three finance managers in three different types of companies, as we've observed them reading, talking, listening, or just thinking, their roles in modern business may have appeared less dramatic, less exciting, than those of the men who turn out the goods and put them into the hands of customers. But I think we found evidence that without these finance managers, the goods and services of American industry would never be produced or sold. National Educational Television.